Hello, my name is Alex Schilbach. I am from Macquarie University in Sydney, and I'm going to talk to you today about our research on ultra-fast spin infrared fiber lasers based on novel 2D nanomaterials. I acknowledge the work of two of my PhD students, Louis Zhu and Guy Tripp Baratan. So I'm going to talk to you about fiber lasers for the mid infrared. And I want to motivate my talk by telling you why we're interested in the mid infrared. Well, the mid infrared starts at around 2.5 micron, so it's about 25 micron. And in this uh, spectral range, this spectral region, almost virtually all the molecules have very distinct and very strong molecular rotational and vibrational absorption features. So, what is shown here is for various molecules like uh, carbon monoxide, methane carbon dioxide, we see here that all those molecules have extremely strong absorptions and very specific absorption features. So this can be uh, now utilized for sensing applications to identify molecules, for example, for atmospheric sensing, a very important and topical uh, problem. And we can also target certain absorption features, right? Either you want to identify materials or you want to use and take a known material and target an absorption, for example, for machining of polymers. And most polymers have very strong absorption around 3.4 microns. The fiber laser or a laser at 3.4 microns can be used to machine polymers with very high accuracy and very highly efficient. So I said we're interested in building fiber lasers. Why fiber lasers? Well, fiber lasers are probably the most uh, well-established platform of lasers and commercially uh, most successful type of lasers in the near infrared and the visible. Virtually all lasers used in manufacturing these days for welding, for cutting, machining, basically all fiber lasers and also silica-based fiber lasers. So the fiber itself is a silica fiber. The laser is compact, efficient, so we would like to use those fiber lasers in the mid-infrared. Problem is that you can't use silica fibers in the mid-infrared because silica fibers, as shown here, silica fibers become opaque for wavelengths uh, larger, longer than about two microns. So if you want to move past two micron, you want to go to the mid-infrared, you have to use different materials. So if you go to fluoride glasses, for example, zirconium fluoride, C-blend or indium fluoride, those are fibers that are transparent up to long wavelengths. So we, our research is into fluoride glass based fiber lasers for the mini infrared. I said for a fiber laser to be used in applications outside the laboratory, the laser must be compost, robust, and efficient. So you can use a non-fiber laser, of course, to demonstrate how uh, how useful mini infrared radiation can be for various applications. But for real world use, for use in the field, a laser definitely should be an old fiber laser without free space optics, without fitly parts, cannot be mounted on an optical table. So our research back in 2017 showed that you can generate mid-infrared radiation, broadband mid-infrared radiation based on a setup, which is fiber-based. But as you will see, not all fiber. Yeah. What we used is we built a fiber laser, in this case, a Holmio fiber laser, lasing at about 2.9 micron, pumped, with 11 to 50 nanometer diodes. Those diodes were collimated and we had free space propagation through a dichroic mirror and again collimated the light with the free space optic into a fiber. This fiber laser produced very short pulses, 180 femtoseconds, via a technique that's called NPR, nonlinear polarization rotation. The NPR requires isolator and wave plate. And so you inherently need the free space section in your laser. And our laser had about 1.5 meters of free space section. The output of the laser in our case was then focused into a nonlinear charcoal microwire, a highly nonlinear optical material. And the spectrum was then subsequently broadened out to a full mid infrared super continuum spanning from around 2 microns all the way to 12 microns. So our goal was now to replace all the remaining free space sections in this fiber with an old fiber setup. So from Holmium, we moved to Erbium, because so Erbium can be pumped by pump diodes, which are cheap, which are very powerful, 980 nanometers, and which are fiber coupled. 
So you get those fiber coupled diodes and we can directly connect them to our fluoride fiber laser setup. We changed from a ring cavity setup as necessary for NPR to a linear cavity. We use in-fiber mirrors instead of free space mirrors. In-fiber mirrors are so-called fiber break gratings, which in this case chirped fiber break gratings. They have a, a larger uh, reflectivity bandwidth. And we replace NPR, our nonlinear polarization rotation, with a saturable absorber material that introduces the required uh, intensity dependent loss in order to uh, mode lock the fiber laser, in order to translate a continuous wave fiber laser, transform it into a pulse, short pulse fiber laser. So, those are the three parts that are required. In terms of pump coupling, the problem is that the pump comes already connected to silica fiber. So connect this to our fluoride fiber. We can do this with splicing, this is the standard method of connecting fibers. But when you connect two very different types of fibers, the problem is that silica has a very high melting temperature and fluoride fibers have very low melting temperatures. So splicing is really, really difficult and it's basically impossible to get good splices with very high mechanical strength. So you have developed a method to connect the right fluoride as well as the silica fibers put them into ferrules, align them high, high, high precision, polish them, connectorize them. We have shown that if you do it right, you can get your connector losses down to less than 0.3 dB, which is better than you could achieve if you free space coupling. So pump coupling done in fiber mirrors. Well, to realize in fiber mirrors, we uh, produce fiber break gratings. So what is a fiber break rating? It's a periodic modulation of the refractive index within the core of the optical fiber. And we modulate the refractive index at the core of our optical fiber where our method was called the femtosecond laser direct inscription. Now I've placed the femtosecond laser line by line direct inscription. Based on the fact that if you use a femtosecond laser and you focus it tightly into the core of it, so in, into a, the bulk of a transparent material, Due to nonlinear ionization, you can transfer the energy of the laser pulses to the material, and you can induce a change in the material properties, which can then lead to a change in the refractive index. So that's what we do here. We take a fiber, mount it very straight onto a XYZ translation stage, and then focus the femtosecond laser into the core of the optical fiber. That modifies the refractive index, and we move the fiber through the focus of the femtosecond laser, and we inscribe a line through the the core. We move the fiber, we inscribe another line. We move the fiber, we inscribe another line. Okay. And by the physical period of this grating, so the distance between those lines, the pitch lambda, we can control the reflectivity of this in fiber mirror, the so called break wavelength. Okay. So we've shown that this can be used in all sorts of types of fluoride fibers, Ciblen and Inio fluoride. From Inio fluoride paper, we have recently published an optics paper. So in fiber mirrors, check two. What about replacing NPR? I mean, here you know, they we use nonlinear uh, nanomaterials, and we have chosen platinum diselenide and xene as two promising materials for the vinifera, and we have benchmarked this against the semiconductor absorb saturable absorber mirror, or so-called CSAM, which is the most commonly typed, commonly used type of saturable absorbers. In the mid-infrared also available. It's basically a very thin saturable, a semiconductor saturable absorber layer, which is sandwiched between a semiconductor wafer and a high reflecting mirror. In the mid infrared, there's only one supplier who produces this for the mid infrared, in this case for 2.8 microns, the company in Germany called Datop. So, very limited uh, supply, only one basically. And as you can see, the semiconductor material is a Fairly expensive material, and it's also uh, not very broad band. It can only be used for a specific wavelengths. Two materials that are more broad band, potentially much cheaper and easier to fabricate, is uh, very thin layers of platinum T selenide. We have deposited via chemical upper deposition CVD thin layers of TTSC2 on optically polished sub uh, substrate, and we have tried different. CVD layers, 10, 12, or 15 uh, uh, CBD, CVD layers uh, to achieve optical thicknesses in the order of eight nanometers of PTSC2 on our sapphire substrate. The second material that we use is MXIM. MXIM is a group of materials. Uh, it's 
that the chemical formula M and monoson XNTX consists of an early transition metal, and then carbon or nitrogen in the surface termination. In our case, we use metallic titanium carbide, type 3C2TX. We produce the material via a top down acid etching and then use inkjet printing to deposit it onto our substrate. You can use different printing layers 10, 12, and 15. With this, we set up a test cavity. So we used our erbium dope sealant fiber laser, pump it through the fiber break rating, our fiber connector. At the other end, we collimated the light, we set up a little free space part, and have a, a bulk output coupler so that we have here a tight focus, which is inside our optical resonator, where we can place the different saturated absorbers. So we can compare all the different saturated absorbers in exactly the same cavity. So that's not an all fiber setup, but the idea was just to take one saturated absorber out, put the other saturated absorber in to have a direct comparison. Second, our benchmark was our saturated absorber mirror, our CSAM. And with the CSAM, we achieved Q switch node locking. We have Q switch envelope, and under the Q switch pulses, we have mode lock pulses. The laser was never CW mode locked, always Q switch mode locked for any pump power between two and nine watts. We then put our platinum deselenite material into our resonator, and actually for pump power larger than 2.5 watts, we achieved QCW mode locking. What we have shown is that if we increase the number of uh, CVD layers, we get less and less amplitude fluctuations. So this is shown here, the amplitude fluctuations for uh, a, a, a platinum deselenite cellular absorber, which has uh, six layers. If we go to 10 layers, we can reduce fluctuation. If we increase, increase the layer, however, the output power also drops. And we've tried Xene. Xene very similar. We get very nice stable CW mode locking pulse strength. And again, we observed that the pulse power drops for the number of layers and also the pulse to pulse fluctuations drop. But in Xene, you've shown that if you, for example, use 12 numbers, 12 layers, our pulse to pulse fluctuations are virtually down to zero, and we can still get very high output powers in excess of 600 millivolts. So for this, then we have set up now a true all fiber laser where we then deposit the scene directly onto the end of our fiber, which represents our output coupler. So there's no more free space setup here. And with the same setup, we could still achieve stable mode lock pulse, uh, stable mode locked operation with very little pulse to pulse fluctuations. We could see that the optical spectrum broadens out from the CW case to the mode lock case as expected. We see nice, uh, the RF spectrum shows nice uh, series of harmonics to the fundamental repetition rate of 30 megahertz. Very stable pulse strength for several hours, high auto power of about 600 milliwatts, and our peak emission level, uh, wavelength was at 2.8 micron, uh, corresponding to the pain, the gain peak of erbium, and was defined by our chirps fiber break rating. The pulse duration of our lasers in the order of 10 picoseconds. And this was published very recently in Optical Materials Express. All right, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Maybe to conclude, I've shown you that with MXENs and PTSC2, platinum tiselenite, those are two materials which are very promising, et cetera, so materials for the mid infrared. And allow us to build an all fiber short pulse with infrared fiber laser. And the next step now is to take this laser and again, to see if we can broaden the spectrum again into a mid infrared super continuum, which then can then be used for uh, environmental sensing in the field in, as in an, an old fiber configuration. At the end, I want to acknowledge uh, support by the OptoFab node of the Australian National Fabrication Facility, and in particular, financial support by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, via the Asian Office of Aerospace R&D or AOARD. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>